point, you can post a question, uh, and we will, uh, and John will answer questions um, after his uh, brief talk. That is correct. Yep. So yeah, we'll see them and we'll we'll read them aloud. Um, and uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to have a little uh, video that John has uh, prepared, which is going to be a lot of fun. Um, so uh, what do you think? You guys should, should we go ahead and roll that beautiful footage right now? Let's do it. All right, guys. Rock and roll. Hi, everybody, and welcome. It's John Farr back with another series of Classic Tuesdays sponsored by the Bedford Playhouse in beautiful Bedford, New York. Only this time, it's virtual. Brought to you from my home office via the magic of Zoom. You know, over the past century, in tough, uncertain times, great movies have provided vital therapy, allowing us to share something together and escape our worries, at least for a couple of hours. <laughs> So with that in mind, every Tuesday night this month, we're focusing on a timeless classic that's celebrating an anniversary this year. Tonight, it's His Girl Friday from 1940. Next week, we have All About Eve from 1950, and on the 28th, Tunes of Glory from 1960. Now, these movies are all very different, but, but they have one thing in common. They all improve with age and with repeat viewings. They also offer rich backstories, which is where I come in. We tend to think of movie remakes as a more recent phenomenon, but they've actually been around as long as there have been great stories to tell and retell. His Girl Friday is in fact a remake of a film released just eight years before called The Front Page. The Front Page actually started as a monster hit play on Broadway way back in 1928, starring Osgood Perkins, whose son was actor Anthony Perkins. The play also made stars out of its authors, Ben Hecht, and Charles MacArthur. They'd first met as young reporters in the wild and crazy Chicago of the 1920s. Both would go on to great success writing for the movies. In 1939, their screenplay for the classic Wuthering Heights was Oscar nominated, and a few years later, Hecht would write two back-to-back -back screenplays for two great Hitchcock films, Spellbound and my personal favorite, Notorious. Now, both the play and the 1931 film version of the front page featured Walter and Hildy as male characters. No surprise, since in those days, the newspaper business was practically all men. But under the inspired direction of Howard Hawks, that would change in the 1940 remake. Now, by this time, Hawks was one of the most respected names in Hollywood. He was known for his versatility. He could turn out dramas, comedies, and thrillers with equal flair. Now, Hawks loved the front page, and he loved Ben Hecht and Charles MacArthur. You see, they'd all worked together back in 1934 on a screwball farce called 20th Century, starring John Barrymore and Carol Lombard. Now, that film had been adapted from yet another smash Hecht MacArthur play. So Hawks was totally committed to this remake, even though Hecht and MacArthur wouldn't be available to do the screenplay themselves. Instead, they suggested Hawks use their friend Charles Lederer, who contributed dialogue to the 1931 film version. One day early on, Hawks and Letterer were attending a script conference, and just by chance, a female assistant, in the parlance of the day, a girl Friday, was reading the part of Hildy. All of a sudden, the twist that Hawks was looking for hit him like a thunderbolt. This time around, Hildy the reporter would be female, and better still, her editor Walter Burns and she would be a divorced couple. Now this already great story would have a romantic element. Hawks next turned his attention to casting. Now he was just coming off two movies with Cary Grant, 1938's classic screwball, Bringing Up Baby, and a drama the following year called Only Angels Have Wings. The suave, handsome English actor was, to put it mildly, an unexpected choice to play a hard-boiled American newspaper editor. Clark Gable or Spencer Tracy would have been more obvious picks but Hawks was convinced Cary Grant could pull it off. 
Having worked with him on bringing up baby, he appreciated Grant's ability to handle quick comic pacing and dialogue. And key to making this movie work was to make all the action and dialogue lightning fast. Now, both the play and first film had this speed, but Hawks wanted his version to go even faster. He even wanted to try overlapping dialogue, which was a totally new thing in pictures. Basically, he'd tell his actors to expect that their first and last words of dialogue would get stepped on. Now, he knew Cary Grant could handle that, but what female star could pull off Hildy Johnson? Well, the first and obvious choice was Jean Arthur, who just finished working with Hawks and Grant on Only Angels Have Wings. She'd also played a female reporter the year before in Frank Capra's wonderful Mr. Deeds Goes to Town. But she'd found it hard working with Hawks, and so she turned it down. Carol Lombard was considered, but she was too expensive for Columbia Pictures. Then, in quick succession, Katherine Hepburn, Claudette Colbert, Ginger Rogers, and Irene Dunn all said no. By the time Columbia negotiated with MGM to borrow Rosalind Russell for the part, she knew she was far from first choice, didn't make her too happy. Still, at that time, Ros Russell wasn't as big a star as these other candidates. It was only in that pivotal year, 1939, that she'd finally got the chance to display her flair for comedy in MGM's all-female picture, The Women. So hurt feelings aside, Roz grabbed the part of Hildy and ran with it. And in hindsight, it's hard to imagine anyone else doing it as well. Still, she was nervous, particularly at the outset. This was her biggest part in her most high-profile movie. Plus, she'd never worked with Cary Grant or Howard Hawks before. Now, over the first few days of shooting, she sensed she was firing on all cylinders, but she wasn't getting much encouragement or feedback from her director. Finally, she just went up to him and asked if she could be doing anything better. And Hawks looked at her and replied in his laconic way, you just keep pushing them around the way you're doing. And Roz was immediately reassured. Now for his girl Friday, there would now have to be the other man, the poor guy who thinks he's gonna marry Hildy. And for that, they got character actor Ralph Bellamy. Bellamy, who'd have a long career appearing in later films like Rosemary's Baby and Trading Places, was perfect casting for Hildy's fiance, Bruce Baldwin. He'd already been the other man opposite Cary Grant in another classic comedy two years prior, Leo McCurry's The Awful Truth, one of my favorites. This would be a very happy reunion for him. Now, Howard Hawks was unusual for the time in that he actually encouraged improvisation on his films, particularly his comedies. Ross Russell quickly realized that her co-star had all the best lines. So she literally hired a writer on her own dime to give her a steady supply of gags for each day of shooting. The running joke was that every morning on set, Carrie would go up to her with a big grin and say, well, what have you got today? Carrie, of course, didn't need a writer. Happily contributed several zany lines, breaking the so-called fourth wall with references to that fellow in the movies, you know, uh, Ralph Bellamy. And then, the last man that said that to me was Archie Leach, just a week before he cut his throat. Archie Leach was, of course, Grant's real name. Well, it was a fun but challenging shoot. Ultimately, Hawks made everything look smooth, easy, and natural, but coordinating all the rapid dialogue with the actor's physical movements and gestures was tricky, to say the least. As an example, the restaurant scene with Walter, Hildy, and Bruce took a full four days to shoot. One big positive, the two stars, Carrie and Roz, really hit it off. In fact, they'd become close, lifelong friends. Carrie even played matchmaker, introducing Roz to her future husband, producer Freddie Brisson, and serving as best man at their wedding the following year. His Girl Friday was released in January 1940 to mostly positive reviews and solid business. But mystifying as it sounds, it received no Oscar nominations. Nor had Hawks two other brilliant comedies, for that matter, 20th Century and Bringing Up Baby. For some reason, the Academy has often discounted comedies. Odd, since they're the hardest type of film to do really well. Anyway, it hardly mattered. Hawks, Grant, Russell, and Bellamy would all go on to more successful pictures. And at Russell's memorial service in 1976, it was Cary Grant who delivered the eulogy. Meanwhile, Hector MacArthur's front page would continue to be given new life, both on stage and screen. Billy Wilder filmed another version in 1974 with Walter Matthau and Jack Lemmon, 
and 1988 brought Switching Channels, starring Burt Reynolds, Kathleen Turner, and Bedford's own Christopher Reeve, which transplanted the story to the world of cable TV news. None of these would come close to recapturing the magic of His Girl Friday. Now, speaking of magic, next week we'll be covering All About Eve, my pick for the greatest movie ever made about the theater. You can stream it any time between now and then on Amazon Prime. All About Eve is the masterwork of writer-director Joseph L. Mankiewicz, who incidentally retired to Bedford after a long and illustrious career. Now, as you watch the film, look for Marilyn Monroe in a small but pivotal role. This movie helped make her a star. Also keep in mind that the role of Margot Channing so closely associated with Betty Davis would have been played by actress Claudette Colbert had she not been injured on her previous film. Now that would have been a very different movie. Till next week, thanks for watching and please stay safe. Hi guys, all right, we're back. Uh... Let's get, uh, I'm sure John will be right on in a minute. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to type in uh, in that Q&A box down at the bottom there. You uh, hover your mouse over and it should pop up and you'll see a little Q&A section. That'll give you the opportunity to type a question that uh, John will so happily answer. I know that's part of the fun of these uh, kind of meetings that we're doing right now. And um, I know, Dan has a couple too. Uh, Dan, I think you see a couple. We do. We do. We have a couple of questions that were submitted in advance uh, for some folks. So, uh, John, why don't we start off with a couple of these and then we'll uh, open it up to anybody else who wants to ask. Okay. Uh, so the can first you hear question, me? I can, we can hear you. Yep. Good. So, so the first question, uh, I'm going to just read it straight out uh, that came in is, why isn't Rosalind Russell more famous? Other than His Girl Friday, she never seems to get the same recognition or notoriety that some of her contemporaries like Katherine Hepburn do. Well, it's an excellent question. Uh, <clears throat> one thing I will say about Roz Russell is I don't think Hollywood ever totally knew what to do with her. Um, the, the camera didn't love her. She was not a, she was very attractive. I, I always felt she's, she looks great in that, this movie, but she wasn't a, 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 a great beauty. The, they had to really work on her uh, with makeup and everything else. Um, uh, and so she wasn't necessarily a natural for film. And I also think that she preferred the theater. So she was one of those uh, actresses who did a lot of theater. Um, and by the time she uh, really hit it with His Girl Friday, which was just a year after the women. Geez, she was 33. Now, in those days uh, in Hollywood, that was old. So she still managed to rack up quite a few Oscar nominations. And we all remember her from Auntie Mame and Gypsy and, and Picnic, which is one of my favorite movies. Um, and so she did do movies, but she didn't do them all the time. And she would do lots of Broadway uh, shows and did very well on Broadway. So she had a very active career. It just wasn't dependent on the, uh, the movie business. Okay. Uh, next question, which is kind of in a similar vein to what you were talking about before was, is this, um, is this considered one of the first feminist films, given that Howard Hawks uh, I guess had a bit of a reputation as a womanizer. Well, I mean, it's interesting that I, I, that's an interesting question because I mean, Howard Hawks had a, a great uh, a marriage. His, his wife was Slim Hawks and in To Have and Have Not, Bogart and Bacall's first movie, she's called Slim. Well, that was because they were all very good friends. Uh, and Hawks in his way was a feminist himself because if you look at his Irv, his, his movies, the women in those movies, a lot of them uh, had to operate in a quote unquote man's world and did very well operating in a man's world. Um, and if you look at uh, Gene Arthur and Only Angels Have Wings or indeed Lauren Bacall and To Have and Have Not, just two examples. He didn't, he, the, the women, the female characters in Hawks films were tough and strong. 
even Angie Dickinson in Rio Bravo. I mean, she could hold her own against John Wayne. So in a, in a, in a funny way, I think of Howard Hawks as, as really a feminist. I don't know whether he would have uh, acknowledged that, but the, 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 the key women in his movies were strong and they operated successfully in a male world. We have a, we have a question here from uh, Stacy, who's watching uh, uh, right now. Uh, did anyone ever try to outdo the word per minute record of His Girl Friday and why the emphasis at the time on the verbal speed? Well, it's a funny thing. Um, if anybody tried to outdo that, I don't think anybody could understand what was being said. You can't go much faster than that. And I think what Hawks was trying to do was to build on something that the play and the original film had already done because the newspaper business is a war of words. Blah, 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 blah. Every, you know, all those telephone scenes. And Hawks wanted to see just how fast he could go while making sure that what was being said or the essence of, of what was being said could be understood. So I don't think anybody could have gone much faster, but, but you have to understand in 1940, this was, this was unheard of. I mean, nobody had ever seen anything like this. Robert Altman's MASH, we, you all may remember from 1970, uh, really brought it back with the overlapping dialogue and everybody talking over each other. This had not been done much. In fact, hardly at all. And so Hawks was trying to say, I can, I can go even faster, but I, I can't go too fast that people can't understand what's being said. So I don't think anybody wanted to try to beat that record only because then everybody would be looking just like going, I, I don't understand. You, know, you can only go so fast before people don't, don't hear what's being said. Uh, we have Sorry. another question. Uh, we have another question from uh, uh, Lisa and Robert and Emily, which is what is your favorite scene in the movie? And they commented that you do a great Cary Grant. Well, thank you very much. I look like Cary Grant too, which obviously helps. Um, but no, I think uh, it's it's so hard to say. The, the that restaurant scene uh, that I brought up that took four days to shoot is so wonderful. That probably is my favorite moment. There's an intimacy and a dynamic going on between Cary Grant and Roz Russell uh, that is so subtle, and you kind of that's the scene where I kind of say to myself. Oh, they're definitely going to get together. I mean, they're, they, they belong together for better or for worse, even though he's not going to change. He will never change. And also, I just want to mention how skilled Ralph Bellamy was. I mean, if, if some of you may have seen The Awful Truth, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. But, you know, he has to play this role of kind of this dolt who doesn't, he, he isn't quite getting it. Um, but that takes acting, too. And the three of them are so wonderful in that scene. Uh, it's the, it is actually the one sequence that I like to go back and, and watch again and again, because again, Hawks makes it look so easy and natural. And it's just another scene. But if you go back and look at it uh, and, and watch all the dynamics and all the subtleties and the gestures and everything going on, it's sublime. It's really brilliant. So, so we actually my... have, uh, we have two questions that are kind of in the same vein here. <clears throat> uh, one is from uh, Abbott and one is from Chip, which is uh, talking about Cary Grant. I guess uh, in certain scenes, he seems less Cary Grant-ish. Uh, and then he sort of comes into the part. So do um, you have any comment about his performance, especially in the opening scene, uh, that he doesn't really start becoming Cary Grant per se until Ralph Bellamy joins the, uh, joins the scene? Any thoughts about that? You know, Cary Grant always had a bad rap. Everybody used to say, Cary Grant plays Cary Grant. And he never won an Oscar competitively for that reason. And, you know, it's so funny. I, I, it is, I mean, there are different degrees of Cary Grant. And I think he was trying to play the scene. You know, he was trying to do a build as was appropriate to the script. Um, but he was a, a tremendously skilled actor um, and deserved a lot more credit than he got. Now, you know, he was one of the most popular and in-demand actors 
uh, in Hollywood. So that wasn't really the issue, but they, he never won an Oscar and he should have. Uh, and again, as I mentioned in my talk, comedy was somehow discounted by the Academy Awards in a way that I never really understood. Comedy is the hardest thing to do well. And there you had an actor who could play the dashing leading man in a Hitchcock movie and then could turn around and do a, a brilliant comedy. I mean, when you, I would invite you all, if you haven't done it, to look at his great comedies of the 30s and 40s. You know, Topper, The Awful Truth, Bringing Up Baby, obviously His Girl Friday, which you've just seen, the Philadelphia Story, which was the next movie he made in 1940. He was brilliant. His comic timing and his physical, his agility, his physical agility uh, was unsurpassed. So, um, and I think this is one of his best performances because a lot of people said, why do they, Cary Grant, he's this English guy, you know, this suave English guy. Why are they making him a, this tough, hard boiled newspaper editor? Uh, and yet he was perfect for the part. He could, he could do many, many things. He wasn't, he was not a character actor. He was not a character actor, but he was a hell of a good actor and he was a great comic actor. Uh, so I don't know if that answers the question, but. We have, uh, we actually have two more questions that are kind of, again, somewhat related. Um, one is uh, in the scene in the press room when Cary Grant tells his future mother-in-law to shut up. Uh, that seems a little bit um, out of the norm for the period of having a character behave that way and talk to a woman like that. And um, on a somewhat related, uh, for the time period question, uh, the, the, the cop killer gets off free in the end. And um, any, so the questions are, I guess, given the, the time that the film was made, are those unusual? All right, let's take that one at a time. Um, don't forget, Carrie is supposed to be playing this very, very tough, hard-boiled, ruthless newspaper editor. And obviously, the, 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 you know, the, one of the funniest scenes, frankly, is when the, the mother-in-law, Bruce's mother, gets carried out. I mean, it is absolutely hilarious. And he's ruthless. Walter Burns will stop at nothing to get the story and to get the lady. Uh, and uh, no, I mean, it was very unusual. Uh, but it was farce, so people were laughing. I mean, this was not uh, this was not something that people were like, "Oh, well, this is offensive that this woman would be carried out of there." It was uh, people were laughing uh, as they should have been. What was the second part of the question? The second one was um, in the, the 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 killer, the cop killer gets away, gets gets off at the end of the film, which seems to be against the production code of the time. If that if that's correct. You know, uh, there's the sense that, I mean, the, the guy, uh, the way I read that movie, I mean, it isn't to me a very important part of the movie, quite honestly, but it is like, this is not a guy that is a criminal. Uh, Earl Williams is not a killer. He's not a, a threat to society. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time and whatever. But the, the thing we have to keep in mind is he gets a reprieve from the governor. So there's there's doubt as to whether or not he should be put to death. Um, and that's the whole denouement of the, of the picture. Uh, so um, my view of it is that uh, what, what we should take away is that this is a guy who was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And if there is mercy, which ultimately there is on this guy, that it's the right thing. So it's never been something that's bothered me or, oh, gee, should Earl Williams have you know, was that unusual or should he have been convicted or anything else? He's, he seems like a scared rabbit uh, who, was, um, who was almost a victim himself. That's the way I read it. Right. Uh, we have uh, another one that was here online. Um, any idea why the restaurant scene took four days to film? There was, again, the, the whole, the, the speed of the dialogue in the whole film was a real challenge from the point of view of synchronizing gestures and expressions and movement and everything else. Everything was sped up. So 
it, 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 you know, what would be normal sort of, if you will, blocking and choreography became a lot more intricate and challenging because um, most movies didn't even have to try to deal with it this way. So there was a lot of hit and miss where something, oh, no, that didn't work. No, cut, 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 cut. They had to get it just right. And Hawks was always relaxed, but he was gonna get it right and he didn't care. And the movie did go over budget and over schedule, but everybody understood why, because they understood what his vision was. They, they were making a very unusual kind of movie. And when you hear anybody talk about His Girl Friday, there's one adjective that's always applied to it, fast, fast. Because it is one of the fastest comedies ever made. Um, and what's so special about it is that it really hadn't been done. Even the 1931 film version, which was plenty fast um, and very clever, didn't, didn't go to this, to this extent. So and in many ways, they were pioneering a new technique. Uh, which, which really wouldn't be uh, duplicated or repeated for quite some time. Uh, if you go and watch that movie, MASH, Robert Altman's first really big hit in 1970, he really was going for that as well and did it very well. But that's, think about that. That's 30 years later. Uh, okay, we have one more question that was submitted uh, in advance. Uh, and you've kind of already touched on this subject. Uh, but the question is... Um, can you throw a little love to Ralph Bellamy? Oh God, Ralph Bellamy. I love Ralph Bellamy. I mean, you know, folks, it's been said before. I mean, think about Dean Martin. Dean Martin played the straight man for many years uh, opposite Jerry Lewis. And what, what any comic will tell you is that playing the straight man is as difficult and challenging and requires as much skill as, as playing the, the comic. Uh, and Ralph Bellamy could do it. Uh, you, you just have to look at the arc of his career. Um, he did a wonderful movie, which I recommend to everybody, where he played FDR in 1962 in a movie called Sunrise at Campobello. He's a wonderful actor. And, and again, he also had a very good career on the stage. And his career, I mean, you know, honestly, how many actors have a career that extends into their, you know, 60s and 70s? He had that. And for a very good reason. He was a superb actor. But he was understated. And he really knew how to play straight, play the straight man, which is tough. It looks easy. It's like Hawks setting up that restaurant scene. You say, oh, this looks, you know, this is very, oh, it's what a great scene. It's hard. It's hard to set it up. It's hard to execute. Um, and Bellamy had that gift. And uh, he didn't mind. He knew what he was playing. And he, he did it beautifully. He was a fantastic actor. So um, again, I invite you to to, uh, I mean, uh, our website, Best Movies by Far, has, if you just type in Ralph Bellamy, look at the movies he's done. He was a fantastic actor and he had a lot, a lot of longevity. So I give him a lot of love because he, he was terrific. He really was. Okay, um, if, uh, if anyone else has any other questions to submit, that's uh, all the questions we've got so far. Uh, does anybody uh, listening have any more questions for John? Uh, we do have one more from Chip. Um, this is actually really a comment, but uh, fast is one thing. But what's amazing is that Hawks manages to have up to half a dozen actors speaking fast at the same time in completely different conversations. And the direction of those scenes in the press room is astonishing, which I think you referred to already, John. It was pretty complicated. It's hard to do to set something yeah, like that it, up. Yeah, absolutely true. Because at the end of the day, you could have that filmed and it would just sound like a lot of gibberish and nobody would, you wouldn't be able to, to, to make out anything. So the challenge was to, was to bring up the speed 
but make sure that we had a sense of what was going on and that we could hear stuff. And that was what Hawks was able to do. And that really took a lot of work because that hadn't been done before. Um, and, he, and he made it work. And then the whole thing of, of, of making Hildy Johnson a female character um, was, was a stroke of genius. And, and I will say Rosalind Russell, you know, in a way, she had so many good roles. I didn't, again, another movie I would ask you all to go and watch is Picnic, one of the great sort of, uh, I call it Americana, but it's William, based on a William Inge play. Um, and the story on that is that Roz Russell uh, didn't want to be, and this was a mistake on her part. She did the part. She was fantastic in it. She plays this sort of frustrated school teacher in Kansas. Um, and they, the studio wanted to really push her to be nominated for Best Supporting Actress. And she didn't want that because she'd always been nominated for Best Actress. Uh, and that was a mistake. But, uh, you know, she was absolutely fantastic. The thing I would say to you all is, Look at the, 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 look at Bellamy, look at Roz Russell, look at Cary Grant. Go and find their best movies and watch them again. Because those are three amazing players. Uh, and they had, all of them had very, very, very good careers uh, before and after this particular film. Again, Roz Russell did a lot of theater. Um, but oh my goodness, Gypsy and Annie Mae, I mean, she was fabulous. But Picnic is one that I would have you, uh, have you look at as well. And obviously next week we have All About Eve. I think probably many of you have seen that film, but I'm trying to present movies that, yes, we've all seen them before, but every time you see them, the movie not only holds up, the movie gets better. So, I would encourage you to watch All About Eve again. And the backstory on this movie is incredible. So I hope you come back and tell your friends about this because we want to get, we want to build this. Uh, and then the following week, we have Tunes of Glory, which is a movie that we picked because it's not as well known, but it's every bit as good as the first two entries. It really is, it's fantastic. Alec Guinness and, and John Mills. And again, a, a wonderful backstory, but very much in the context of the British film industry, which is its own little family. And you'd hear a lot more about that. So I hope you all come back and, um, and I'm happy to answer any more questions or do you think we're done there? Uh, uh, I think, yeah. uh, unless does anybody else have anything, I think that about wraps it up. So um, thank you very much, John, and everybody. Thank you all. Here. And uh, we hope we'll see you back next week. Um, we have one little uh, public service announcement we've been asked to make. Um, we are, the, the Playhouse is uh, going to be a, a food pantry collection point starting tomorrow um, with starting with working with the Bedford Armagh Rotary Club. So uh, if you are so inclined to help donate, to uh, uh, give, us, give an assist for people in this time where we're all, uh, all could use a little help, please do so. And, um, we will thank you very much. We will, uh, if there are any questions that come in after, we'll have John see if we can respond to him privately. <laughs> I just volunteered you for that. Good. I'm happy to do it. All right. Yeah, thanks. thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, we'll see you next time. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>